The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. You found the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Here's the host, Bill Spone. Welcome back to another edition of the Building HVAC Science Podcast, where it's our goal to try to help create better, more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians. I also want to try to help the two professions better understand each other with the ultimate goal of making customers happy in the homes they live in and the buildings they work in. I've been working in this market for about 30 years, and I've come across a lot of interesting people and interesting facts and questions on my mind. So that's what this podcast is about. It's about things that I find interesting. This episode of the podcast is made possible by myself and by my producer, Brian Orr, and also the joint efforts of the Blue Collar Roots Network, the BCR Network. Take a look at the other fine shows we have going there, HVAC School, Tool Pros Podcast, and Service Business Mastery. You can find out more about that at bluecollarroots.com. If after listening, you like what you've heard today and you've not subscribed to the podcast, please do so by typing Building HVAC Science into the search bar of basically any podcast service. You can also look it up and you'll find it on the Libsyn and you could play it right through your browser or you can play it in your browser at bluecollarroots.com forward slash building dash HVAC dash science. In today's episode, we'll hear from Charlie Cicchetti of Green Building Education Services. Charlie will discuss his career path and give us an explanation of all the different facets of LEED, including operation maintenance, interior design, uh, community development, new development, LEED for homes, and also something called the Well Building Standard. All very interesting things. It's uh, more of a discussion about where the market's headed in terms of environment and health in buildings. I think you'll enjoy this episode. And we look forward to your feedback and comments on this episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. And today I have the pleasure of having with me, virtually with me, is a fellow named Charlie Cicchetti. And he's pronounced that like spaghetti. Is that right, Charlie? Yeah, that's right, Bill. Uh, Cicchetti like spaghetti, a good Italian name, lots of vowels. Perfect, perfect. Charlie comes to talk to us today about lead primarily. Very diverse, interesting guy, but give us just some quick background so my listeners understand what LEED is. L-E-E-D. What does that stand for? What does that mean? LEED is if you want your building to get certified as a green building, as an eco-friendly building, the U.S. Green Building Council nonprofit over the last 18 years has had this program called LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. A lot of your listeners have probably seen it, LEED for new construction, but you can also do it for interiors. And my company, we do a lot of lead for existing buildings and green up our existing building stock, save energy, save water, all the way through the gamut of materials and better air quality and productivity. So lead, it's kind of become the premier, hey, let's get that green stamp of approval on our buildings. So does that stamp apply to what type of buildings? Is it primarily commercial, institutional, residential? Where does it cross? What kind of fields does it cross? When LEED first came out, Bill, in the year 2000, it was just LEED for new construction. So new commercial buildings out of the ground, but then it evolved, uh, LEED core and shell. If you're a speculative developer building that shell warehouse or that shell office, tenants haven't moved in yet, then they came out with LEED for commercial interiors, one floor, five floors in a building. And then it evolved to existing commercial buildings, but we also have residential, single family, so that's LEED for homes, and then multifamily, that's three stores and lower can also be lead for home. So there is a lead rating system. That's the program for many different building types now, but it all started with new commercial buildings out of the ground. Is it primarily a rating system or when does somebody get involved if they're interested in say having lead assigned to a building? If it's new construction, is it early on in the middle of the process? How does, what does the involvement kind of look like? Yeah, ideally early, the developer or architect would pull in with a team of sustainability experts to really say, hey, what would it take to go for a LEED certification? There's certified silver, gold, or platinum. How green can we make this building? And of course, developers are going to do it for different reasons. But to answer your question early, technically, could you have baked in a lot of green best practices in the design and decide to go for LEED later? Yes, but it's going to cost less and be easier the earlier you talk about going for an official LEED certification. For a commercial building, who can do it? Is it an independent? Do they have to be certified? Do they have to be trained? How does that work? 
And that's a good segue to credentials. That's a big part of what I've done over the last 10 years in my green building careers. We do a lot of training. And so there is the lead green associate professional credential, the lead AP. You can decide, am I specializing in new buildings or interiors or existing commercial buildings? So credentials help. They bring a lot of validation and just good training. Hey, I understand this process. I understand the green building best practices. Let me bring that to the table on all the projects I work on. So credentials help. A lot of times a consultant's brought in, right? Been there, done that. We can move quicker and uh, we have the lessons learned. So I'm also a lead consultant in my team. But if it's a new building, hopefully the architect is driving these conversations as they're typically involved the earliest with the developer. And then you might bring in some consultants to start shoring everything up and getting everything ready. So it's been in process and sort of morphing and changing with the market and sort of finding its own course over the last 18 years. Just kind of frankly, how successful would you say it's been? Has it been tremendously successful? Is it growing lately? Is it some challenges? Very successful. 18 years of lead. The statistic today is 2.2 million square feet every single day is getting certified all around the world. So even though this is the U.S. Green Building Council's program. It's actually getting used overseas quite a bit. Uh, A lot of multinational companies from the U.S. taking it overseas to their other offices and manufacturing facilities. There are other programs in different countries, but but LEED's really won out. It's really become the most popular. So we're seeing a lot of greening of existing buildings now, which is good, right? Because our building codes, Bill, and you and I have discussed this before, are getting to where we're moving towards not just really efficient buildings, but one day net zero is going to be building code. But what do we do with our existing building stock? So I think lead for new construction continues to go strong. Are there some developers that have been doing this for 10 years and now they just say, hey, what we do as a best practice is good enough for lead Do we need the plaque? Maybe, maybe not. You know what? There's so many others that are just now coming around to LEED and green buildings. They're going for the official certification. So we're seeing a lot of growth with LEED, but let's not forget that greening of our existing commercial buildings is really growing fast. Seems like to be a really good growth area would be the existing buildings. And I know it's very different from when you build something to start, but once it's already been built an existing building, you got to have some challenges or limitations. Does the process kind of occur differently? How does that happen for an existing building? Lead for new construction, we're getting credit for setting up the building to be a green building, the green infrastructure. Let's design it to be much more energy efficient than code minimum, much more water efficient in our restrooms than plumbing code minimum. Let's put out bike racks so that people that move into that building, they actually have another way to commute. Maybe we're close to the train. But lead for existing buildings, it's how do we run that building day to day as a green building? Do people actually walk or bike or take the train? Actual performance. When it comes to energy savings, do we continually try to do better and get a better energy star score? So lead for new construction, we get credit for designing and building green. I'm sure a lot of your listeners in the cities they're in, they see these lead plaques when they're walking in a building. Sure. Lead for new construction, you're getting the credit for the infrastructure. Lead for existing buildings, it's about do we operate green every single day? Just in my mind, there's kind of like this logical connection. At some point, a new building becomes an existing building. Does it take a different path to be run as a green building? How does that work? Yeah. And this is one of those pet peeves in industry is we have some net zero buildings that are being built, but are they being run like a net zero building? Are we building a Tesla, but are we running it like a very inefficient car? There's a gap. And and I think that's somewhere a lot of your listeners can help too. Just contractors, subcontractors, better training, better handoffs. Here's the state of the art technology that we just put into this building. And let's make sure we have video training and anyone in the future that's brought onto the team, they really understand how to run this building the way it's supposed to be ran. So to answer your question is there's still a little gap between the new building going to operate as efficiently and as green as possible. Lead for existing buildings though, if you have a really good property management team, you have good ownership that really wants to continually improve the building, Does a lead plaque for them help them attract certain tenants? Are they doing it because they know their building could be worth more because it's going to cost less on their power bill, their gas bill, their steam, their water? And so people are getting into it for different reasons. But I think big office building owners, for example, they see that the operating costs are going to be reduced and it helps them attract certain tenants. Let's take a step back and learn more about you, Charlie. How did you get involved in this? What's your background? 
I'm in Atlanta, Georgia right now. I grew up in the North Georgia mountains. I went to school at Georgia Tech, but I actually got a business degree. However, I've always been around construction. My grandfather was a civil engineer in New York City. He even worked on like the Holland Tunnel. My dad later in life became a journeyman carpenter. So I went to get a business degree from this great engineering school, but I was always around construction. And then I started working for a large general contractor in the Southeast learned construction. Then I worked for a large real estate developer that was an early adopter of LEED in the mid-2000s. Talk about right place, right time to get an additional skill set. After I uh, left that real estate developer, we started our green building training and consulting firm and just have grown it like crazy over the last 10 years, even through the recession. So construction, real estate, green buildings, that's been my path. I looked at your LinkedIn profile, which you sent me the link for, and you have a number of designations after your name. I got to know, what do these initials stand for? (laughs) These 100 question tests are tricky, but as a trainer, as a consultant, I need to go take all of these. So for anyone listening, there's the lead credentials and you have to start, they changed this a handful of years ago with your lead green associate. It's a professional credential closed book exam. Then later you can specialize and I've taken all of them. BD plus C is building design and construction. So new commercial buildings out of the ground. O plus M is operations and maintenance. I'm also a specialist with greening of existing commercial buildings. I, D, and C, interior design and construction interiors. ND, neighborhood development, live, work, play communities. And then homes, uh, as we mentioned, is single family and multifamily, less than three stories. And then the new one is the well accredited professional, well AP, and build this whole wellness real estate movement. Because it's not just about let's be good for the environment, more eco-friendly. That's what LEED does. And LEED's going strong. But now there's this next chapter of wellness and healthy buildings. So is well part of the U.S.? GBC or is it something that stands on its own? They partner. Yeah, good question. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace. So technically, there's the U.S. Green Building Council. They invented LEED and they keep it updated. But then there's another entity called the IWBI, the International Well Building Institute. And so they keep this new well program updated. So they partner, they go hand in hand, but they are two different organizations, two different programs. What we're seeing is a lot of projects will do LEED. And then they might try to do well or one of the other wellness programs in the marketplace. The new development aspect, that's pretty interesting. It's a little different where that seems to be becoming more complete, more system oriented, more sort of whole life or or people oriented, actually. It sounds like it's changed the focus from what's good for the building to what's good for the people that work, live, play in the building. I like that aspect. Is that something that's resonating with the industry or is it still in development? It's early for it to be mainstream. LEED and Green Building's official certifications, I should say, have been around for about 18 years, about uh, the year 2000. Well, has been around for three or four years now. What's happening is there's a tremendous amount of curiosity. I'm doing a lot of training all over the U.S. about what is it? What should we be doing? How do we get ready if someone asks? And a lot of the how do I pass the exam so I'm ready. Now, we are seeing some growth. I think right now the wellness movement is an easier fit, quote, easier fit for tenant build out. So an office space within a building, maybe a core and shell building out of the ground. But to take entire large buildings through this right now, it's tough. And I'll tell you why. I love the program. I'm a fan. Some of the credits, some of the things we could do, they're called features, have to do with HR policies. Are we reimbursing our employees if they go to the gym a certain amount of times a month? Are we reimbursing our employees for Fitbits and Apple Watches so they can monitor their steps and their health? And there's so many really interesting things that aren't just the built environment, but are conversations that companies have to have if they're inside of a building, which every company is, right? I don't care if you work from home, if you lease space, if you own your own building, like if you go to a coffee shop, like- Maybe a landscaper, you know, landscaper, there's no building. Well, (laughs) yeah, true. There you go. But the wellness movement, you nailed it. It's about the people, leads about the environment. And so it's what's interesting is, and to answer your question more directly is, it's doing okay and we're seeing some growth, but it's only three or four years in. It's going to take another couple of years to become more and more mainstream. But what's happening is we have to change the conversation, Bill, from kilowatt hours saved, think LED lighting on a lead project, to productivity and less absenteeism. And people aren't sick and they just really love coming to work because this is the 
healthiest work environment they've ever been in. They have natural light coming in, better air quality. And next thing you know, if you're working late on a project seven, eight o'clock at night and the lights overhead, those fluorescent lights aren't tricking your body to think it's high noon. Instead, it's actually a dimmer light that's telling your body, hey, it's about time to rest. So it's all about the uh, healthier uh, workplace right now. And I know this is the next chapter of the green building movement. Um, It's growing. So I'd say there's a lot of momentum right now. But to all your listeners, I would suggest they go to wellcertified.com and just be reading up on it. Hey, how might this affect me? If I had a client ask about well or this new healthy building movement, what do I need to know now? Interesting. So just even the process, I would say you can become educated. You don't necessarily have to adopt. You don't have to pick up what he's laying down here, folks, but you could just learn something. So see how it shapes and changes your thinking. That's what it's all about, I'm sure. Yeah, and a few direct tips. Again, if you're in the HVAC and the air quality side of things, it's you might be asked not just for MERV 13 filters, but you might be asked for UV light on the coils. You might be asked to put carbon filters in the ducts. You might be asked to do a certain level of air quality testing like we haven't had to do before. Particulate matter 2.5 and 10 and not just your formaldehyde and carbon monoxide, but let's really make sure this can pass industry standards. This can pass the well benchmark. So again, don't drop everything and freak out. It's like, oh, everything's going to change. No. If you were asked to assist a well project, know that three or four, maybe 10 items might be affected by your scope. Know enough that you can be confident on that project and you'll look like the hero because that's what it's about right now. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So if you can confidently say, hey, we're up to speed on it. This is new, but we definitely can help you here, here, and here. I mean, it looks like you're on top of your game. Exactly. So you used to work for, you said, a real estate and developer and construction, but what do you do now? What occupies your time now? What companies do you own? What are you involved with? What do you do? I love entrepreneurship. I've discussed that. I have two businesses in this green building movement, two small businesses. I like to say we're small giants in this green building movement because we work with some amazing clients and customers all over the U.S. and actually now some internationally. So Sustainable Investment Group, or SIG, that's my green building consulting firm. I have a couple partners there. And so we'll work on the lead projects, but we also do engineering, energy models, and commissioning for new buildings. On existing buildings, like in New York City, we work on quite a bit of buildings in New York City, Bill. We'll do retro commissioning and we'll do outside air testing or bringing in enough outside fresh air to this critical zone. And so that's really been complimentary. Not only are we the consultant and going through the entire program, making your buildings better, but we have that engineering, that technical service team. So that's a service-based company and that's called SIG. And then on the other side, We love to teach. And I've got an online education company called Green Building Education Services. And we were the first to make lead practice tests over 10 years ago and really have helped a lot of people advance their careers, pass these tricky exams. So I love to teach, love to work on buildings. And that's what's kept me busy over the last 10 plus years. You want to share the websites for both those companies? Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. So SIG Earth, S-I-G-E-A-R-T-H dot com, SIG Earth. That's our S-I-G. That's our consulting firm, SIG Earth dot com. And then G-B-E-S dot com. Those are our websites. That's the Green Building Educational That's right. Services? That's correct. Cool. Everybody, nothing operates in a vacuum anymore. Information travels very quickly. People will also be perhaps running across different programs that they'll think are competitive with LEED or think are competitive with WELL. Can you speak towards what else is out there? What else are people going to encounter? Yeah. And as consultants, I mean, we're not doing our job unless we show you the menu of options. Now, LEED has one out. I compare it, Bill, to listeners probably get this one, Blu-ray and HD DVD. So Blu-ray, one out. In this case, That's what's happened with LEED. It's the premier program if you want your building stamped as a green building. However, you're going to see in the U.S. a program called Green Globes. If some of your listeners do work on higher education or some uh, GSA, some government work, you might see Green Globes. Essentially, there's no prerequisites. It's just a point system. LEED, though, does, I forgot to mention, have prerequisites, some things you have to do just to play the game. So here in the U.S., you're going to see LEED, Green Globes, 
And then if you really want to get excited, you got to look up one called the Living Building Challenge. Essentially, what if our buildings could be not just net zero, but net positive and actually be regenerative? And that uh, there's not a lot of buildings that have accomplished it yet, but you can do different pedals within that program. So in the U.S., those, I'd say, are the three most popular programs. In the U.K., there's a program that was out there before, LEED, called BREAM, or some call it BREAM. They're trying to break their way into the U.S. You'll see that on some office building projects. For example, LEED is the premier program, new buildings, existing buildings. But take a look at Green Globes, the Living Building Challenge. But existing buildings, though, don't forget, we have to benchmark how energy efficient are we. And there's actually a good program that the EPA and Department of Energy have, and that's called Energy Star. So your monitor, your TV, your laptop might be Energy Star rated, but your building can actually get an Energy Star certification. And we do a lot of this work. How efficient is our building? Are we in the top 25% for all office buildings in the U.S.? Let's get an award for that every year. We're energy efficient, the Energy Star program. So the Living Building Challenge, is that sponsored by any organization? Well, that's an interesting one. There was the Cascadia Green Building Council in the Pacific Northwest, and they were part of the USGBC, but then kind of came out with this super advanced program and and kind of broke off on their own. So now there's the International Living Futures Institute, another organization to look up, but ILFI. Great program just to get inspired. And that's what I challenge all your listeners to, Bill, is You're going to be working on projects that don't go for these official plaques, these official certifications, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't look to these programs for best practices. Hey, can I implement this and this from that program? Man, it's going to make my building that much better. Yeah, it's a progression of spectrum. It's not a binary kind of thing, not on or off. What would a lead, you mentioned the prerequisites, can you go over some of those prerequisites and the point system? Is that kind of the main structure of it in the evaluation? Yeah. So within LEED, it's 110 possible points. And there are some things you have to do called prerequisites. You don't get points for those. And I'll give you a couple examples. We have to, on a new building, be more energy efficient than energy code. In most parts of the United States, ASHRAE 90.1 is our energy code. Unless you're, say, in California where it's Title 24, which is more stringent. LEED says, hey, that's nice just to meet code minimum, but no, we want you to do better. Can you do 5% better? That's the prerequisite. Can you do 10, 12, 15? The more energy efficient you are over code minimum, what we'd have built anyway, the more lead points you get. And there's a range of extra energy points you can get. Water fixtures. Hey, we have to save a certain level of water in our restrooms. Let's use the, maybe not waterless urinals, but pint flush urinals, the more efficient toilets, the aerators and the faucets. Can we do that? But what if we did it at a higher level, we get extra points. So the way LEED is laid out, there's some things you have to do called prerequisites. And then there's a lot of optional points. For your listeners, understanding the industry you're in, I would just suggest, hey, we have to bring in enough outside fresh air. And that's ASHRAE 62.1. If we could bring in more air, but we have to balance that with the energy loss, moving and conditioning more air, we get additional points. Can we use MERV 13 filters? Can we do some air testing? Can we flush out the space? What can we do to make sure our air quality is at a really, really good level? How does this shift over? I think you did mention residential or there is something for homes too? Yeah, Lead for Homes, uh, great program. I think what happened is Lead for commercial buildings during the recession stayed pretty strong because the military and the federal government required Lead on all their buildings. And some developers that were still building commercial buildings said, hey, this can really differentiate me. It's a great marketing opportunity and we're going to do lead. So lead for commercial buildings actually grew throughout the recession. Lead for homes took a hit, but it's come back and you can do lead for homes or lead for your entire neighborhood, that live, work, play community. Lead for homes has some prerequisites. And then it of course has optional items to get you to certified silver, gold, or platinum. Some examples there would be, we would get into the blower door testing. We would get into the HERS ratings and we would get into the overall energy efficiency of the home. If your garage is attached, hey, they prefer that not to happen. You need a separate exhaust for that. Can we have a detached garage? So it takes a look at the overall air quality. Do we do radon testing? That's required on all lead for homes projects. So great program, look into it more. But I think it's come back around and those that are using the Lead for Homes program in some states, 
you can actually get uh, property tax abatement for a number of years. Some states have said, hey, if you build that new home and it's lead for homes and it's been adopted by your county, you can actually get some property tax savings. So great program. There's some incentives out there, lead for homes. Got it. And I don't know if we mentioned before in our previous conversation, actually, so folks, Charlie invited me on to his podcast that was a couple weeks ago or three, four weeks ago. So that's how we met. He approached me and it's, it's been a very interesting conversation we developed. And I'm not sure if I mentioned then, but I'm actually in the process, my wife and I are of designing and building a new oh, home. Yeah. yeah. And so we're looking at high performance aspects. So this is personally interesting beyond just for the podcast here. So uh, I want to thank you for that. Yeah. We'll have to look it up and see if Pennsylvania has those abatements. New York state has passed that law. Uh, if you build leap for homes, you can get some uh, property tax uh, abatement and I'll have to look into that for you. But it's exciting. And does it cost a little more to get your home officially certified? It'll cost a little more. But what happens, in my opinion, is when you go to sell that home, in some cities, this is already happening. When I bought my home that my wife and I and our three boys live in now in the Stone Mountain area, just outside of Atlanta, I requested all the power and gas bills. I want to know what I'm buying in this house. And we're starting to see more transparency. When homes change hands, you have to share utility bills. But you know what? If you're a lead for homes certified home, I mean, you're going to get a premium one day if you need to sell that house. How would people know if there's, say, there's a lead home in their area, if they'd like to experience it or look at it or see, is there anything like a directory or is that still kind of private or what? How does that work? To help grow this overall platform, they've got a pretty good directory. There's really two places to look, and, and I'll give you the links. But one is usgbc.org, and then at the top, you'll click on directory and then projects. And then another one is gbig.org, and that's the Green Building Information Gateway. And that's another just you can look up your state, your city, zoom in, and it'll have little icons for who's doing green building certifications in my area. And so those are two good resources, usgbc.org, click on projects directory, and then GBIG. They actually pull from the same database, but they kind of present the information. One of them does more of a map, and one of them is like an Excel spreadsheet. Interesting. (laughs) But yeah, I think there's some great case studies of homes that uh, hopefully you can get a tour and just go see and get some inspiration. Absolutely. The person that does this has to have, you mentioned the training, the education. Are they available just to talk with, to reach out to, to find someone in your area? What are they called and where can you find them? So on the lead for commercial building side, once you register a project, you can contact the authority with questions, but sometimes you've brought in a consultant. But on the lead for home side, Bill, it's in a different setup. You actually will look up in your state. There'll be a few what we call green raiders, and they actually come out during construction of the home, and they're actually verifying during and at the end of the home's construction. So just so everybody knows, on the commercial lead side, I told you there's 2.2 million square feet of buildings certified a day. They couldn't fly out enough people to certify. So we have to have a back and forth online review. We submit all of our documentation. Here's what we want to get credit for. Here's what we did. And we have this review process. But on lead for homes, it's different. Someone does come to your project during and at the end of construction. Those are called green raiders. And honestly, in your case, I would just be connecting with those professionals just to pick their brain and and who knows, see what it would take on the lead for homes certification in your area. Interesting. I cheated here. I'm in front of a PC. So I looked down and I found somebody that I know, actually personally know, and I didn't know he was a green raider. Oh, a green raider? There you go. <laughs> and he's, he's actually involved in my house project too. So this is great. We had this conversation. Sounds like a lunch meeting soon. Good. Yeah. You never know how all these things will work out. Let's just kind of take a little different twist. Where do you see this going? Where do you see this progress going? You've obviously devoted a lot of your time, your life, your energy to this. You believe in it. You're an entrepreneur. You own a couple of businesses. Where do you see this moving to? What do you think the future looks like? Because sometimes we have to stop and think. And if we're in it, there's others that are just now getting into it. Let's give them the pro tip of, hey, make sure you're reading up on this too. So you already have the shortcut of, hey, here's what's coming. Here's what's around the corner. In my opinion, is LEAD is still going strong. So understand that that's the most popular program. How would I use it? How would I apply it? So have a a fundamental understanding of LEAD. But what is happening in the U.S., I think, is our new construction codes are speeding up and we're getting more aligned to be net zero sooner than later. And that's exciting. But what do we do with our existing building stock? You're going to see a huge opportunity 
to green up existing buildings, so to speak. And so make sure you're really understanding how can we support those existing buildings, especially those existing commercial buildings. Wellness real estate, we talked about it. There's two programs, Well and FitWell, F-I-T-W-E-L.org. FitWell is a CDC program about healthy buildings. So there's kind of a couple buildings, certifications for wellness real estate. I'm sure you've talked about it before, but the internet of things, our homes, our buildings getting more and more connected, real-time air quality readings, not just temperature, humidity, but what if we had real-time VOC, total VOC and particulate readings? What if we had real-time people count on a floor in a huge building in New York City, and then we can really ramp down the air and save energy And so I'm excited about the sensors. I'm excited about the wellness movement. I think LEED is going well. It's really growing internationally. And of course, I'm biased, but I suggest everyone get a credential because it forces you to get up to speed quickly and pass a test. And then you've got the latest information. But LEED is steady. There's other programs like the wellness movement. And then, of course, keep an eye on all things sensors and uh, artificial intelligence in our buildings and homes. It's pretty awesome. It sounds like I'll probably have to have you back in a while because it sounds like it's kind of fast paced and moving along. Anytime. This is a blast. I want to thank you for coming on. Any kind of closing thoughts you'd like to share? I think there's some that pretend to have confidence about green buildings or lead. Oh, I worked on a project seven years ago or I read a book five years ago. You know what? Just understand that that it changes, it updates and humble yourself. Or if you have a client that claims to be the expert, but they're really not as is just point out, hey, these programs continually update. The bar gets raised. I'm updated on the latest and greatest version. So don't think you have to go back and read 18 years worth of material. No. What's the current program? Because then you're going to have the latest cliff notes on the green best practices. So at least do some reading, take some online courses. Maybe some of you want to take a credential. But then the next meeting you're in, if you just have a little more confidence that it's like, hey, I really understand the latest tweaks to these programs. I promise you it'll pay dividends. And just sort of an expanding thought on that note, where do people that become LEED certified professionals, where do they come from? What are they doing before they get into this? Some architects, for example, require, if you want to work at their firm, you have to be a LEED professional at a certain level. I think if you're in the AEC, architecture, engineering, construction world, you're going to have more pressure to get the credentials just to be job competitive. If you're a service provider, a vendor, a subcontractor, I see one or two people on the team being the in-house lead expert. So I think it's important to have at least someone on the team understand lead. But that's where the credentials come from. We're seeing a shift, though. More and more property managers, facility managers, even some real estate brokers on the existing building side go for their credentials. But for the longest time, and the momentum is still... Because on my education company, we have a lot of analytics, Google Analytics, our internal data. It's still a lot of construction and architecture professionals, some MEP engineering professionals going for these credentials. But if a lot of vendors and subcontractors don't have it, hey, you know what? You'd be one of the first to do it. If any of you are hesitant about lead, just knowing your space and HVAC and air, air quality, I would go all in on well because there's only 3,000 people in the world that have a well AP, and there's 200,000 people in the world that have a lead credential. So just think, what would this do for you? And it's like, well, why not? Yeah. Nah, I like it. Nice. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Well, Charlie, I want to really thank you for uh, coming on and talking with us today and sharing your tidbits of information with our audience. Folks will have some information in the show notes with some of the links that we talked about. So you can get directly in touch either with Charlie or with some of the programs that he discussed today. So again, thanks, Charlie, for coming on. Yeah, anything I can do to help. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Okay, take care. Well, thank you for listening today. We hope you grabbed some good information from Charlie about well, lead, and other aspects of the kind of green buildings movement. If you want to keep up with other things that we find interesting, please follow us on Facebook by typing Building HVAC Science into the Facebook search bar. I'd like to share with you a quote for the day, something that's pertinent to what we discussed here. This is by Jimmy Dean. Not sure it's the guy with the breakfast sausages, but Jimmy Dean said, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. 
If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Building HVAC Science Podcast, please email me at bill underscore spohn, S-P-O-H-N, at bluecollarroots.com. Some of the topics we discuss require technical training for proper interpretation or safe execution. So if you're a trained pro, you can go right ahead and do it. If you're not, please consult with and hire a trained pro. Also, if you're in the market for some tools or test instruments that we mention or refer to in the podcast, I own a company called True Tech Tools, and we sell a lot of the same kind of diagnostic equipment that we mention sometimes on these shows. You can find us at www.truetechtools.com, T-R-U-T-E-C-H-T-O-O-L-S.com. You can also use the code HVACBS for a nice discount. That's HVACBS to get a nice discount when you shop at True Tech Tools. As always, thank you for listening and for following us on Building HVAC Science. And if you've not subscribed, we encourage you to do so. It will really help out our ratings in the eyes of Google and iTunes. We look forward to having you back again on the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Take care, everyone.